South Africa is heading for its own version of the Arab Spring. That's the warning from former President Thabo Mbeki. He says current head of state Cyril Ramaphosa has failed to tackle poverty, unemployment and inequality. It's a rare attack by Mbeki on the leadership of the governing African National Congress. Why is he speaking up now? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. It was an unprecedented outspoken attack on his own party and its leader. Thabo Mbeki warns that one day South Africa is going to explode. The former president was speaking at a memorial for a veteran member of the governing African National Congress. Mbeki, who in 1999 succeeded Nelson Mandela, the first democratically elected president, warned of widespread civil unrest comparable to the Arab Spring. He says South Africa is facing unsustainable levels of poverty and unemployment and blames current president Cyril Ramaphosa and his government for failing to address the legacy of apartheid. You can't have so many people unemployed, so many people poor, People faced with this lawlessness I'm talking about, faced with a leadership in which they see these ANC people one after another are called corrupt. One day it's going to explode. Ramaphosa is a former freedom fighter who was once jailed by the apartheid government. He took office in 2018, succeeding Jacob Zuma, whose term was mired by scandals, corruption, mismanagement of millions of dollars in taxpayers' money. Ramaphosa's presidency has faced several challenges. His response to the COVID-19 pandemic was applauded, but his party was accused of mishandling millions of dollars in relief funds. Most recently, he is embroiled in a scandal known as Farmgate. Ramaphosa is accused of corruption in connection with the theft of around $4 million in cash from his farm, with a criminal complaint filed against him for alleged money laundering, kidnapping and the concealing of a crime. And let's now go to our guests all in South Africa. In Durban, Dakota Lahuete is the ANC national spokesman. In Cape Town, we have Musi Maimani. He's the founder of the One South Africa movement and a former leader of South Africa's opposition. And in Johannesburg, William Gamede is an associate professor at the School of Governments at the University of Witwatersrand. Thank you all for joining us. Can I ask you first, Dakota, is Thabo Mbeki right when he says South Africa is ready to explode? Look, Thabo uh, Mbeki is right in the fact that there is no government that lives to exist on its own. We become a government because we can provide for our people. Today, according to statistics in South Africa, over 25 million South Africans live without food daily. And today in South Africa, we have more than 5 million undocumented uh, foreign nationals who are not uh, documented by our home of racism. And, and that creates a problem. OK, thank you. Uh, and, and, uh, OK, so, uh, Musi, what do you think? South Africa ready to explode, as Mbeki says? Certainly. I, I hold the view that the ANC, like any other liberation movement, have come to a point where they've mismanaged the economy, leading lines and lines of unemployed South Africans. Literally, we live in a country where the majority of citizens are living below the upper poverty line, and youth unemployment now constitutes close to about two-thirds. So two-thirds of young people here cannot find a job. So given those sets of circumstances, without the prospects of a tomorrow, President Mbeki is correct in his summation that South Africa is facing an explosion. Where I would urge for him to go further is the reasons that come through that have been part of his own party, the mismanagement of economic infrastructure, and ultimately the lack of policy direction amongst the government has brought us to this particular point. William, what do you think has prompted Thabo Mbeki to speak out now? 
I think, you know, we are, if you look at our environment, we could compare where, um, you know, the Arab Spring just, um, you know, the months ahead of the Arab Springs, we cause exactly the same environment now. I mean, the first thing it really is a failure, a total failure of the state uh, to deliver, then a social order breakdown in the country, law, uh, a rule of law and order a breakdown, and then combined with the biggest financial crisis in South Africa in generations, um, caused, of course, uh, by the COVID um, the financial crisis, uh, or the COVID-19 related financial crisis, and now the impact uh, of the Russia-Ukraine um, war, and then you link it with, with mismanagement of the states and mismanagement of the country's um, um, e e economy. Now, you combine that, and then, you know, um, um, high, the highest levels of unemployment are recorded in any other um, emerging market, and then you combine it with something else, and the something else that we combine it in South Africa really is you have um, an elite um, who is in charge, but who seems to be not have the ideas, or who seems to be socially distanced, live in a bubble, um, who seems not to understand um, uh, what's happening because of social distance between the governing party and its elites, and ordinary citizens who are struggle, who are struggling. Uh, you know, it's too wise, and so there's an unresponsiveness from the governors. Uh, and then linked to that is also an arrogance uh, of by the elite. So then what happens then, if you, if you got that, um, it's really an explosive um, situation, particularly also when the governing party try to continue as business as usual in the biggest crisis, certainly um, in a living memory. I mean, we've seen it last uh, last week, for example. Um, interest rates will, uh, will increase. Okay. Um, uh, you know, across the economy, the state has been okay. increasing uh, um, um, rates and services fees, right. but yet the state is not delivering. Dakota William there talks about an elite living in a bubble. A bubble. Has the ANC lost the confidence of South Africans? Is it? Uh, uh, does its elite not understand what needs to be done? Has it been in power for too long? No, the ANC in itself does not exist on its own. It exists because it's an instrument of liberation. The ANC is not a narrow nationalist organization. We are not a Nazi or a fascist organization that seeks to defend a particular interest. We exist because we defend the South Africans, we defend our people. And that's how we exist. And, and, and you know, South Africa with its complexities in terms of national identity, it's a country that needs the African National Congress. It's a country that needs something like the ANC to exist because on our own, we're not like China, where is China? Or we're not like Germany, where is Germany? Yeah, we exist out of multiple uh, origins of nationalities and any non nationalist organization will not survive in South Africa except the African National Congress. And you need to understand that as okay. ANC, so far with all our weaknesses, we we are ready to search for it. We are ready to improve okay. lives of South Africans and we are ready to find a better life for okay. all South Africans and all people all of right. humanity. And Thank you. that's how we exist for Thank you. Musi uh, Dakota there defends the legacy of the ANC, acknowledges its weaknesses, but you've said uh, Cyril Ramaphosa should resign. But would that make any difference in, in the current circumstances? Well, it would start the direction of the country in the right way. I think President Ramaphosa and his government have proven that they are unfit. I think we need a fresh reset in South Africa, a new government that is led by competent South Africans whose focus is on the future of this country. The key failures aren't just in economic mismanagement. The ANC in and of itself is delivering a situation where 80% of our learners in this country uh, are, are in schools that are dysfunctional, which means that the long-term trajectory of South Africa is hard. Furthermore, that it's the same ANC that's allowed corruption to thrive, certainly under President Zuma, and it has continued under President Ramaphosa, who he himself has now been allegedly been embroiled in. So whatever emerges out of the new leadership that uh, Mr. Dikota is talking about self-correction will be a compromise to preserve status quo and lead no one to jail. So if you really want to reset South Africa, we need a new leadership, 
We need a new coalition and we need an economic vision that says how can South Africa not only intertrade within Africa, but compete globally with other markets in recovery to a post-COVID universe and okay. furthermore to ensuring that youth unemployment does not become the trend. Okay. William, after the well-documented rampant corruption of the, of the Zuma years, Ramaphosa was supposed to be a, a new broom, wasn't he? What's, what's gone wrong? I think, you know, many South Africans do not understand that, um, you know, the corruption um, under the Jacob Zuma presidency um, was so systemic. Um, I mean, you know, there was a corruption not only of the state, corruption of policies, corruption of rhetoric, of ideas, um, you, you know, for, for procurement, and also the corruption of the party, of the ANC, the governing party. Now, normally in societies, once you get that kind of systemic corruption, and, and Jacob Zuma was there for 10, you know, for almost for a decade, we call it, you know, the lost decade, it takes at least another 10 years to get back to where he started. And that's normally, you know, where I sit and the kind of research I do, looking at other comparative um, developing countries and, you know, how they got out of corruption and when they got in, in, into corruption, how long it takes to get out of it. Um, so, and if you look at the African situation, you know, since African liberation movements since the end of the independence, now at that moment, you know, if a country spends five or 10 years systemically corrupt as a party or a state, it takes about 10 to, tw uh, even in some cases, 20 years. And then, of course, we've seen in some countries, um, they've never gotten out of the corruption, um, where there's uh, Zimbabwe and so on. So you can't get out of that state failure if the governing party is, uh, is still there. So what we need, we need a step down, actually, after the ANC is a governing party and get new people uh, to come in. I mean, that really is almost the only way to renew the country, the state, um, the society um, and the country's uh, culture. Uh, Dakota, not much confidence uh, from our other guests in, in the ANC's capability to manage this. We've had the final findings of the three-year inquiry into state capture presented. It revealed endemic corruption, as we've talked about. Ramaphosa has promised a plan to implement the report's recommendations in four months' time. Does the ANC realise how critical this is for the party and the government? Indeed, we're critical. The ANC, like I said before, we are an instrument of liberation in the hands of the people. As the NC, we can own corruption. As the NC, we can own corrupt elements. We are very clear and resolute in our position that those who are corrupt are not part of our mandate because our mandate was to liberate black people in general and African in particular from the bondages. Dakota, can I, if I may interrupt you briefly, I don't think many people dispute the ANC's revolutionary credentials in terms of en ending apartheid, but with youth unemployment the highest in the world, with record levels of poverty and inequality, the ANC is failing to deliver those now, isn't it? It's revolutionary credentials accepted, but now it needs to deliver for today. Indeed, it's correct. We need to deliver what we are supposed to deliver, and a man's part of it was to deal with the epidemic problems of unemployment. And unemployment is a manifestation of the ANC failure to deal with the issue of the colonial economic structure, wherein minorities who are mainly from European descent are in charge of the economy and the financial structure of our country. And I think as the ANC, we don't have to limit ourselves to a point whether we deal with scraps of social grants for our people. We need to get okay. to a point where we transform the combating heights of the economy, including the economic ownership of our country, as well as the outlook of okay. who owns the economy in our country. William... We are an African country for the start. Oh, okay. It cannot be correct Thank that you. the majority of the economic structure right. of our country is still European and colonial. William, are you confident that Cyril Ramaphosa can, up, can come up with those recommendations in, in, in four months, or is the, is the rot too deep? I think the rot is too deep, um, and it's very difficult now, because, you know, you also understand that Ramap uh, President Ramaphosa um, is also now engulfed mm. um, in the allegations of corruption around what has happened at his farm, the, um, what is called here in South Africa, Farmgate. And I think his focus now really is in trying to 
um, you know, to survive, politically survive um, and that scandal within the ANC, you know, is up for you for re-election at the ANC's December conference. So between now and the end of the year when the ANC's uh, election conference takes place, I don't think President Ramaphosa will be focusing on the crisis. Neither, sadly, the ANC will be focusing on the crisis. On the one hand, uh, President Ramaphosa is going to be uh, trying to campaign to get re-elected and to try to clear his name. Um, uh, and so on until December. And on the other hand, what we're seeing in the country, and maybe that is what is generating so much hopelessness um, and anger in the country, is that the ANC really is focusing on its own internal battles from within. And even the conversations that the ANC has, the conversations is so far from, from the crisis. I mean, the ANC is talking and ANC leaders are talking, uh, blaming apartheid, blaming colonialism, but the ANC has been in power for over three decades. You have to imagine, over three decades, the ANC, you know, the ANC is in charge of the state, it's in charge of the economy, it's in charge of the country's policy, whether it's domestic or foreign policy. Uh, you know, no one after three decades can still blame um, the past with the one, if one has had, as a party, such a monopoly control um, over the state since okay. the end of apartheid. Musi, I know you've written recently that South Africa, African leaders actually should look to what's happened in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, that in Sri Lanka uh, uh, was a revolution against uh, elected representatives. And similarly in South Africa, you had violence last year that might be a taste of what's to come. That makes it different from the Arab Spring. That was a revolution against dictatorships. Is democracy letting people down in South Africa? No, I think that I think the economic circumstances are often hard in this country. But what I'm starting to realize at this point in time is that as the maturity of the electorate start to realize that even though they exercise the vote and the promise that the ANC puts forward of this so-called renewal is not occurring, their frustrations are bubbling over into the streets. And I would argue that their frustrations will soon bubble over to the state because the ANC as a liberation movement is no different than any other one in the rest of the continent. At first, they garner the state, they mismanage it, and then they find creative ways to stay in power. So projectively, you realize that the future of the ANC is no different to that of ZANU-PF in that these could become liberation movements that start to infiltrate the judiciary, uh, frustrate media independence, and ultimately obfuscate election results. So we have okay. to work hard in the period now so that democracy is maintained in this country or we face the real prospect of outside interests that can motivate and disillusion youth to be able to create this instability in the country. We'll come back to that subject in a second. Uh, but Dakota, what do you think Cyril Ramaphosa's, Ramaphosa's chances are of winning re-election as the ANC leader later this year? As the ANC, the future of any leader or any policy depends upon the basic structures of the ANC, which are branches. Ramaphosa re-elections and any re-election of any leader, including myself, depends on the branches. And that's how it works in the ANC. For now, no leader is guaranteed any re-election. For now, no leader is guaranteed any stay in the party. What happens is that any leader would have done what is supposed to have been done in terms of the last conference resolutions, the last conference policy positions. And, and, and once that leader is determined by structures with the NC, he will come back. And it's not difficult even for President Ramapos to come back once branches oh. of the NC are comfortable okay. with his performance with his ability and capability as a leader to deliver the manager of this. OK. W William, deliver. thank you. Yes. W William, just help us understand the day-to-day -day living circumstances of ordinary South Africans at the moment. Like in many developing world countries, people live day-to-day. -day. What they earn that day is what they spend on food at the end of that day. There's no weekly shop hedging against inflation, that sort of thing. How are ordinary South Africans surviving at the moment? I mean, I think, you know, because this is the biggest financial crisis, um, at least in the post-democratic era, but certainly this may be the biggest uh, 
um, financial crisis um, since the end of the Second World War um, in South Africa. I mean, if you think about the numbers, two thirds of all young people are unemployed. If you think of, you know, another number just in terms of adults being, uh, yeah, uh, almost 50 percent of adult South Africans are unemployed. Um, we've now getting fuel prices because of the impact of the Russian-Ukraine war. Fuel prices in South Africa are sky high. Most people take. I mean, most people are just uh, just give you an example. I mean, about 30, 40 percent of people's um, of income at the lower end um, of spectrum in South Africa spent on transport. So all of money goes there. We may even have now potentially the highest inflation. A rate um, in you know in the post um, um, uh, apartheid era, very very typical space. Then you know a public health or state health system um, because the state has failed has absolutely collapsed. If you go to a hosp public hospital now, the joke is um, in South Africa you go there to die. Um, a public ed education system, schools and the townships. Um, if we compare, you know, let's just say mathematics compared to our emerging markets and even our, our African um, our counterparts, um, we're certainly among the worst um, um, if you compare um, with um, uh, our public education with other countries. And then, of course, we've got over 800 state-owned entities, certainly any emerging market um, okay. um, of our peers, certainly the most um, state-owned companies, uh, yeah, um, if you compare to our other emerging markets. But Almost 90% of all of those state-owned companies have all failed. I mean, they bank up um, in the last decade. Just um, um, 1.5 trillion rand has been used yeah. to bail out just state-owned uh, uh, companies. This is a real crisis. I mean, okay. it is, as I say, um, the biggest um, um, financial crisis in living memory. Okay. And uh, uh, Moosey, isn't the problem for you that the politicians that are capitalising on the circumstances William talked about are the ones from the populist end of the spectrum? You've had two new parties uh, making big gains in municipal elections that run on anti-migrant platforms. You have Julius Malema of the economic freedom fighters who went round with people into restaurants demanding to know if they employed foreign workers uh, the other day. They are the politicians making inro inroads here, whereas people like you who want to try and bring races together, are struggling against that populist wave. Yeah, I think globally we went through that wave and uh, you described periods that occurred even pre-COVID and maybe to some of the time we saw in the US what that meant. We saw even some of the French elections and all of those. All, so the global phenomena was in place. But I would argue, William, that in fact we are now getting to a point where as more and more people realise that actually the rational center argument has to be restored back into South Africa. There are more people now trying to coalesce around the center. And I would argue the case that come 2024, you'll see that in place. Because the plans for majority of South African citizens, they realize if, if, if they all blame the immigrants, as sometimes even the ANC wants to do, you would have had a far greater growth. But we are now describing six, five or five, five to 10 percent. I want to say this equally so, and this is a very important point, is that what the greater disappointment with the ANC has been is that we've been through periods in the past where we actually did see economic growth, where we did see infrastructure being built in a democratic era, and that has all dissipated, and the ANC is not going to be able to redo it. Okay. And that is what we still need. We need that 5% GDP growth. Okay. We need that infrastructure rebuild. And I think citizens like myself and many others are now starting to form that coalition in the centre that will be able to bring about that middle ground, that central vote, to be able right. to bring about the change in 2024. OK, very last, very quick answer to the, uh, to the independent here at the table. William, do you think the ANC can recover in time for the national elections or do people like uh, Mumsi have a chance? Um, you know, my sense is this is the end, um, the decline of the ANC. You know, um, in Africa, if you look at it, uh, our African history outside South Africa also, but about a third decade, um, you know, the generations um, that voted for the ANC, uh, for a liberation parties, and, and if the liberation party fail, um, they quit uh, voting okay. um, um, for their party. So we we at that stage now. Um, it it okay. does appear, I think, um, really to be, um, that the ANC will um, uh, drop below 50%. If it's lucky, it would be, you know, mid-40s. Um, if um, President Ramaphosa is not at the head of the ANC, very likely to the mid-30s. Um, and if the ANC dropped below the mid-30s, it won't be able to put a coalition um, together. Right. Um, but if it's sort of in the late um, or the mid-40s, okay. it should be able to put a coalition together. Right. But it will never be able, I think, to govern on its own anymore.
All right, we are, gentlemen, unfortunately out of time. But thanks to all our guests, to Dakota Lawete, to Musi Maimani and to William Gumedi. Thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for more debate, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here, bye for now.